everyone. Welcome to our special live coverage of President Yoon suk yeols speech at Harvard Kennedy University. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. President Yoon suk yeols state visit to the U.S. continues. We will soon head over live to Boston, where he'll deliver a speech at Harvard and speak about freedom, including the threat it faces and solutions that needed to overcome such threats. The president will make the address under the theme of New Journey Toward Freedom. Now, Friday's speech will make Yoon the first Korean leader to give an address at the prestigious university. As he previously mentioned when speaking in front of Congress on Thursday, he is expected to underscore the values of freedom and solidarity. The past four days of his state visit to D.C. was primarily focused on politics, foreign affairs and security. But he is spending a full day in Boston, where he'll be centering on the economy, education, and future generations. Now, Boston is a home to a world-class bio-cluster, and that's why he took the time to tour the MIT earlier in the day and held talks with leading scholars in the digital and bio sectors. His last day in the U.S. also included attendance at a roundtable with experts and business people working in innovation clusters. There, they discuss ways to cooperate on securing an innovative ecosystem. Again, now we are connecting live to Boston. We are seeing John F. Kennedy Forum at Harvard Kennedy University. And that's where President Yoon suk yeol will give a speech as the first Korean leader to do so at the university. Now, he will speak about freedom, including threats it faces and solutions that are needed to overcome those threats. The theme this time will be New Journey Toward Freedom. Now, again, we are connecting live to Harvard Kennedy University. The scene we are seeing right now is the John F. Kennedy Forum, where South Korean leader uh, Yoon suk yeol will deliver a speech for the first time as the South Korean leader. Now, before coming to Boston today, he was in D.C. for the past four days, where he spoke in front of Congress. Uh, there he talked about the values of freedom and solidarity. And also his trip in D.C. primarily focused on politics, security, and foreign affairs. But now he is spending his last day in the U.S. in Boston. There he is centering his talks on economy, education, and future generations. Now, it looks like his speech is about to begin. Uh, let's take a listen. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me add my own warm welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at Harvard Kennedy School. It is my honor and pleasure today to introduce our distinguished guest, Yoon suk yeol the President of the Republic of Korea. In a few minutes, President Yoon will speak about the challenges to freedom in the world and about the appropriate responses to those challenges. After the President's remarks, he and Professor Joseph Nye will engage in a conversation, and then the President will take questions from the audience. Our mission at the Kennedy School is to improve public policy and public leadership around the world and the forum has long been a venue where heads of state speak about pressing policy issues facing the people of their countries and facing all peoples across the globe. I am delighted that so many of you are here today and watching today to hear President Yoon's perspective on pressing issues. South Korea has been a key ally of the United States for 70 years and has been described recently as an economic and technology superpower. Moreover, Harvard and the Kennedy School in particular have been closely engaged with economic and security issues in South Korea for many decades. Edward Mason, who was dean of this school from 1947 to 1958, Dwight Perkins, who was the director of the predecessor of our current Center for International Development, and other members of our faculty worked with Koreans on the economic development of their country. Graham Allison, Joe Nye, Ash Carter, and other members of our faculty had important roles in preventing the wider proliferation of nuclear weapons, a goal that was reinforced by the declaration that Presidents Biden and Yoon signed on Wednesday. 
and some key members of the Korean government are graduates of the Kennedy School or of other schools at Harvard, including Prime Minister Han duk Su, Foreign Minister Park Chin, the Director of the National Intelligence Service Kim Kyu Hyun, and the Minister of Unification Kwon Young Se. We are pleased and honored to play such a constructive role in the country's success. President Yoon was inaugurated as the President of the Republic of Korea nearly one year ago, last May. He is a lawyer by training and a public prosecutor who served as Prosecutor General from 2019 to 2021. Throughout his career, he has been recognized for his skill and success in tackling high-profile corruption cases, and as Prosecutor General, he focused on fighting corruption. Now, in his current role, President Yoon has emphasized the importance of upholding values such as human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. He has pledged to work across the aisle to achieve progress that benefits everyone. He also believes strongly that Korea has a responsibility to the international community. As you all know, President Yoon made an official state visit to Washington, D.C. earlier this week. He spoke with President Biden and to a joint meeting of the U.S. Congress and was honored with a state dinner. President Biden emphasized the importance of the long-standing alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States, and the two presidents issued a joint statement outlining various aspects of collaboration between the two countries. We are so fortunate that President Yoon has decided to visit Harvard as part of his trip to this country. As I mentioned, President Yoon will be joined in conversation with Professor Joe Nye, Joe is a distinguished expert on international relations and an emeritus member of our faculty. He served as dean of the Kennedy School from 1995 to 2004. It is always good to have him in the house. Please join me in welcoming Joe Nye and our distinguished guest, Yun Suk Yol, the president of the Republic of Korea. I'm filled with emotions to have this chance to have a speech as the 20th president of the Republic of Korea here at Harvard University, where Syngman Lee, the first president of the Republic of Korea, studied for the independence and future of his country 110 years ago. I have visited Harvard University in 2018 when I was the chief of the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office, and it was an inspiring visit meeting with the faculty. In particular, Professor William Alford, who is with us today, emphasized the value of freedom and solidarity and the importance of solidarity with the, with the vulnerable with an example of Harvard's program for the disabled. When, ever since I was a young jurist, it was an important Thing, which was the value of freedom and human rights, and I obtained a deeper understanding of it. Of it. Today, I would like to talk about the value of freedom. Human history has been a history of defending and expanding freedom, liberated from the fetters of one's social status in the medieval. It has been a long journey to create a world where one can create their own life freely. There is Freedom Trail in Boston. The traces of the pioneers who came to the American continent in search of freedom can be found on that road. 
They created the foundation of the liberal democratic nation of the United States. And at the center of all this was Harvard, which was established as an educational institution for training priests in the 17th century. The desire for freedom nurtured at Harvard by founding fathers such as John Adams and John Hancock permeates the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. The United States has won and expanded freedom through the process of the independence and the founding of the nation. In the late 18th century, it was laissez-faire, which means let it be done by themselves, and that was the freedom in the early days. Initially, a free market without interference of a state was considered a good thing, but in the 19th century, late 19th century, a monopolistic conglomerate called trust became extreme, and it was realized that the industrial society can be threatened. The critical mind that my freedom should not infringe on the freedom of others, the demand for a fair system erupted. In this context, Sherman Act, enacted in 1890, has an important meaning in the history of freedom. The Sherman Act was enforced actively with the decision of President Theodore Roosevelt, a graduate of Harvard. During his term, he, even call, he was even called a trust buster for prosecuting over 40 trust-related uh, incidents during his tenure. With the addition of the values of fair competition and fair opportunity, the freedom has developed into coexisting and solidarity. Freedom comes with responsibility, and that responsibility comes from fairness, a condition for freedom to coexist. And the rule of law is to embody this fairness. Such value of fair fairness and the principle of fair competition have supported the sustainable growth of the U U.S. economy. The history of freedom that began in the United States took root in the Republic of Korea across the Pacific Ocean. In 1950, the Republic of Korea was attacked by the communist force, and when that happened, United States and other free nations participated to fight together with us. Captain William Hamilton Shaw, born in Korea, studied under the guidance of Professor Reicher in Harvard, and he volunteered for the Korean War and was killed in action at the age of 28. The Republic of Korea built a memorial park on the hill of Nokbondong in Seoul, where he died at the time, to, rem to remember the Harvard alumni who loved Korea more than Koreans. Here today, we have with us William Cameron Shaw, the grandson of Captain Shaw, and his mother, Captain Cameron, Carol Cameron Shaw, from North Carolina. Where are they? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We remember your family. Thank you. On behalf of the people of the Republic of Korea, I would like to pay my deepest gratitude.
Just now, I stopped by the Harvard Memorial Church to honor the 18 graduates who died in the Korean War. Their noble sacrifices, thanks to the, that, the Republic of Korea was able to uphold its freedom. The communist totalitarian forces their illegal attempts could be prevented and suppressed. The Iraq US alliance celebrating its 70th anniversary this year has been a pivotal axis that has safeguarded freedom and fostered prosperity of the Republic of Korea. And it was also a symbol of safety to protect freedom of the citizens of the world. A day before yesterday, together with President Biden, I adopted a joint declaration that encapsulates the acting alliance, the alliance in action. The ROC-US alliance is not a contractual relationship of convenience, but it is based on a universal value and it is a value alliance, an alliance that is sustainable and resilient an alliance, a just and righteous alliance that contributes to the world and peace, world peace and prosperity. Distinguished guests, the world today, the freedom and democracy that we protected with our sacrifice is under serious challenge. Democracy is a community decision-making system to ensure freedom. Democracy is based on truth and free formation of public consensus. False propaganda and fake news that is combined with digital and mobile devices, they are distorting the truth and public opinion, and that has become a common practice. And thus, democracy is shaken and freedom is being threatened. In the recent days, AI technology is exacerbating this situation. Democracy is an institution based on intelligence, represented by common sense, truth, and conscience. False propaganda and fake news, which is anti-intellectualism, threatens democracy and puts freedom in crisis. There are forces that systematically and continuously undermine and threaten freedom and democracy, which is dictatorship, and totalitarian forces, and there are forces that stand by them to take advantage and to fight against them and to defend freedom and democracy, we need courage and solidarity with the people longing for freedom, their solidarity is needed. And we also need international solidarity. Freedom guarantees peace. People who value freedom and, con freedom and countries that value freedom, they respect others. The international community would the international, in the international community, there are forces that would like to alter the status quo by force. The international community defines this as violation of international law. The invasion of Ukraine has uh, been continuing for the last year, more than a year. And the invasion of the international law brut brutally on the freedom of human rights of the Ukrainian people. The Republic of Korea continues to support the Ukrainian people, and we continue to expand humanitarian and financial assistance to the country. The attempt to change the status quo by force, we need to stand up against them as in solidarity with the community, with the international community. And we need to prove that such an attempt cannot succeed and they need to understand that it is impossible for them to succeed. North Korea is the epitome of dictatorship and totalitarian and their attitude and disregard for freedom of others. 
North Korean illegal development of nuclear weapons and nuclear threats are not limited only to the Korean Peninsula. It is seriously threatening the peace and freedom of the neighboring countries and the world. Such totalitarian attitude is inevitably leading to her horrific human rights violation in North Korea. Last month, my government publicly published a report on human rights situation in North Korea for the first time. The report, based on the testimony of more than 500 North Korean defectors, contains horrific cases of public executions by, uh, for watching South Korea. Korean TV programs or possessing a Bible. The improvement of human rights of North Korea begins with the disclosure of such reality, widespread awareness and awakening of the international community will lead to an improvement of the situation in the North Korean society. The most serious challenge to freedom and democracy in the world is by dictatorship and totalitarianism. Nevertheless, those who threaten freedom and democracy are disguising as human rights activists. We should not be deceived by them. And to do so, we all have to have a very strong and firm philosophy and belief in freedom. Students and faculty of Harvard University, which is the Hall of Freedom, freedom cannot be defended alone. We must unite and be in solidarity to confront the forces that threaten our freedom. I cannot help but mention President John F. Kennedy, who is the most beloved Harvard alumni, his address in 1963 in West Berlin. The forces that threaten freedom are both within and outside the community. A community is not a free society if the freedom of one person, even one person, is neglected. A free society requires all members of the community to be free, free and enjoy the freedom. To enjoy freedom, we need certain economic and cultural preconditions. The preconditions to enjoy freedom are what free citizens must work together to create. For those who need them, therefore, freedom and solidarity, the concepts are mutually inclusive. There are no concept of solidarity that could exist among people who are ruled by someone else. Even if there is a phenomenon that seems like it, that would be by, by order. Dear Harvard, faculty and students. We are living in the digital age, and now we have to think about freedom in the digital age. The mankind in the 16th century, during the age of exploration, we broke away from the status order of the feudal era and established a modern order of occupation ownership. In the early 20th century, the United States established a fair market by fighting monopolies. And now, as the digital era is deepening, we need new norms and orders. With the digital technology, an abundant amount of information is being produced ceaselessly. And thanks to that, human life has become more convenient and enriched, but also there are negative effects that suppress our freedom. A state power that does not respect the value of freedom, misusing the digital technology is something that we can imagine. That would be a severe violation of freedom and human rights and digital totalitarianism 
uh, would be prevalent. Free citizens of the world must unite to stop such abuse of digital technology. In September last year, I presented New York Initiative at New York University calling for solidarity for digital free citizens. The core of it is to define the, the digital technology and services as a universal right of mankind. And I also presented a vision that, that the digital age, what the digital age should pursue. The digital order created in the new space and in order to have legitimacy, universality, and sustainability, the order and norms must maximize the freedom and welfare of the global citizens. In particular, we have to consider uh, the vulnerable. To this end, the, universe, the international community should also come together. The leading countries in digital should help other countries with insufficient digital infrastructure. The Republic of Korea will do our best to build a fair digital order in the international community. In addition, by expanding digital ODA, we will strive to share the joy of digital technology and the culture with the global citizens. I would like to ask the people who are here today to join us in solidarity and cooperation in our pursuit. Today, as the President of the Republic of Korea and before that as a free man, I am very happy to speak with you about freedom at Harvard, which is the hall of freedom. And personally, this is an honor that I will remember for a very, very long time. Thank you. Thank you for that stirring address. And we have been very fortunate to have wonderful Korean students at the Kennedy School. And now we'll count you as an honorary graduate. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, you have accomplished a great deal in your first year. Uh, and one of the great accomplishments is the Washington Declaration that you and President Biden just signed. It means that South Korea is treated as an equal of our NATO allies when it comes to nuclear consultations and planning. And this is a very important accomplishment you have created. With that said, I noticed that China issued a statement condemning the Washington Declaration. Will this hurt your relations with China? Uh, so the relations with China is also is always based on mutual respect and we pursue the mutual interest of the country. The Washington Declaration that was adopted is about nuclear threat of North Korea and there infringement on the UN Council resolution and there threats that is becoming even more serious and their threat 
is not only threatening us, but it is also threatening Japan and the United States. So it was an inevitable choice of mine. Uh, another major action in your first year was to re reaffirm the relationship with Japan, which had become very troubled. And when we look at the problems of Korea and Japan, we can fully understand the historical reasons why many Koreans look back at the relationship with Japan with a certain sadness and anger. But nonetheless, both you and we and Japan face a problem which is called North Korea. And looming behind that is the rising power of China. In that sense, it was very brave for you to reaffirm cooperation with Japan because your predecessors had resisted that. On the other hand, you were criticized in domestic politics for doing this. How do you see further cooperation with Japan and Korea? A lot of countries were under colonization or they were colonizing, like the UK and India, France and Vietnam, Korea and Japan would be examples. The history not being able to overcome the history that becomes a stumbling block for cooperation of the present uh, is not so common. And through serious wars, and a lot of people were victimized. And even then, in those cases, countries cooperate together for a better future. An example would be France and Germany. And I believe uh, at the moment, uh, most of the people who experienced the colonization do not survive to this day. However, most of the Koreans related to the colonization era, have, I understand that we have the sentiment of conflict uh, against Japan. However, cooperation for the future, and if we do this properly, our conflict would, I believe, uh, and strive discord with Japan would be uh, cleared out. And I believe that we have to break away from the sentiment that if we do not uh, resolve the past issues, we cannot go one step further. That's not where we should stand. The emotional sentiment and such things that uh, are existing in the society would be cured uh, if we have a proper cooperation in the future. And we took the initiative uh, towards the Korea-Japan relations, normalization of the relations, and there were some criticisms that it was not reciprocal by Japan. However, this morning I uh, was told that Japan uh, decided to restore the Republic of Korea on their whitelist. So I believe that this is a step forward. What, as what I just mentioned. And in Sudan, as uh, people are evacuating from Sudan, 
The embassy of Korea and embassy of Japan, they are cooperating on the ground uh, as they are uh, evacuating our people. Such things uh, could not be imaginable just three or four months ago. Uh, if we look at the Washington Declaration, it is a major accomplishment. But an article in the New York Times last week suggested that it meant that both Seoul and Washington were now accepting North Korean nuclear weapons. Uh, is that an accurate perception? Or to put it more broadly, uh, how should we deal now with North Korea's nuclear weapons? The Declar Washington Declaration is not, absolutely not, a declaration uh, to admit North Korean nuclear arsenal. It is more of saying it is more of uh, putting emphasis on the illegal, illegality of North Korean nuclear arsenal. And the nuclear weapons of North Korea uh, should not be approached by the concept of disarmament. It should be by denuclearization. And if North Korea uses their nuclear arsenal, we have to let them understand very clearly what are the consequences. And this is where we stand in the approach of North Korean nuclear threats. And there is a high possibility that they uh, would not give up on their nuclear weapons. So we want to deter them from using nuclear weapons to protect the Korean people and the people of the world. Turn to a somewhat happier subject than nuclear weapons. <laughs> South Korea has become notable for its soft power, the ability to use its cultural resources to attract the rest of the world. What can you tell us about what you're doing to increase South Korea's already impressive soft power? <clears throat> the Republic of Korea, we have BTS, Blackpink, and movies like Minari, Squid Game, Parasite, and such content. Well, I, I'm heading the government, but even so, I can say that the government did not do much for such success. It was purely done by the market itself, and it is a consequence of the cooperation with other countries like the United States. The soft power, unlike uh, hard power or heavy and chemicals industry, those could be nurtured by the state, but soft power is different. As Professor Nye, uh, Professor Nye's 20 years ago publication about software, I read that book as well, but soft power could not be nurtured by the state, but all we could do as a government is to look out on uh, any regulatory uh, hindrance and maybe form a single uh, regulation across the world that could help the soft power could flourish. Yesterday, I was uh, 
invited by the Film Association of the United States, and there were a lot of uh, people from the film companies like Warner Brothers and Paramount and so on, and I told them that uh, you could come freely uh, into the Korean market if there are any hindrances uh, by regulation. I will do my best to get rid of those, so I am going to try to make a single market across well, the world. I would say that's a perfect answer. <laughs> you would get an A at the Kennedy School. <laughs> It's time now for us to broaden uh, the question period. And we have two microphones here on the floor and two in the balconies. Uh, so let me first turn to your question and introduce yourself and your relationship to the university. And make sure you remember a question is brief and has a question mark. Hello, oh, thank you, I understand. So, uh, Mr. President, my name is Kim Matsumura Jr. and I'm a student at Harvard Kennedy School of Government from Japan. I was happy to see on the news that you visited Japan last month and enjoyed your favorite omurice, omelet and rice with Prime Minister Kishida. I'm so happy with that. Following Professor's point, I would like to ask the President about the future of Japan-Korea relations. Last month, uh, as we discussed, uh, South Korea proposed a solution uh, to one of the pending historical issues, and it can be said that a certain conclusion has been reached. In order to develop Japan-Korea relations in the future, it is very important that this trend and momentum toward a resolution of the history issue not be interrupted. Mr. President, um, what efforts are you going to make to ensure sure that this solution and any positive actions on the history issue that may arise in the future are stable and irreversible, even when the cabinet members in each country change? Or what do you want Japan government to do in terms of this issue? Uh, yeah, 지난달에 대통령님께서 일본을 방문하셔서 또 기시다 총리님과 오므라이스도 드시고 좋은 시간 보낸 것에 대해서 저도 감사하게 생각하고 있습니다. 저는 한일 관계의 미래에 대해서 질문 드리겠습니다. 어, 한국 정부가 또 어, 저희 간에 풀리지 않던 그 이슈에 대해서 어떤 해결책을 제시했습니다. 저희가 미래의 관계를 더 발전시키기 나아가기 위해서는 이러한 과거사 차원의 해결 노력이 무의로 돌아가지는 않도록 저희가 계속 최선을 다해야 한다고 생각합니다. 그러한 차원에서 이 과거사 문제 또 해결책을 지속시키는 데 있어서 어떠한 긍정적인 어, 조치를 검토하고 계신지 그렇게 함으로써 저희 한국 정부와 그리고 일본의 내각의 교체가 있다고 하더라도 이를 불가역적으로 진행시킬 수 있을지 그리고 또 한편으로는 일본 정부에 대해서 이러한 차원에서 기대하고 있는 조치가 있으신지 여쭙겠습니다. 우리가 <웃음> 현안과 미래를 위해서 for the current issues and for present uh, for the future uh, and cooperating for uh, the present and future we could take measures as we go by but the historical issues that's is a emotional sentiment. It could not be resolved at once with a, with a certain measure. I believe a change is necessary, and I want to start that change to happen. And the peoples of the two countries uh, being friendly to each other and being more cooperative to each other and to have more interest in the, uh, and each other's culture uh, are the changes that I would like to bring upon. And with that change, and that change becomes a flow, constant flow, and if that happens, uh, even with the change of government or cabinet, that flow itself would not change because that would have taken root in the people of the two, the right two countries. Balcony. Oh, I'm sorry, the translation? <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you for your question. And um, when it comes to a certain, a certain pending issue or our cooperation for the future, the government can take certain measures. However, when it comes to resolving the past history issue, it is about the feeling of the people, and there's no silver bullet about this. 
We need a fundamental change to resolve this issue, and I am going to begin this long process. As soon as our peoples, the Japanese and Korean people, becomes more favorable to each other and work together with each other with better understanding and more interest in the culture of each other's country, it will make a large current that is irreversible and regardless of the change of administration. So I believe that this bond and exchanges between the people is a really important issue and this is what I'm going to embark on. Balcony on the right. Good afternoon, President Yoon. 안녕하세요. My name is Yinak Von. I'm a journalist from Germany and currently a visiting fellow at Harvard University. First of all, thank you so much for coming. I feel very honored to take part in this special moment, especially as a second generation Korean myself. My question is about Korea's support to Ukraine. Yesterday at your speech at the US Congress, which I found remarkable in many ways, um, in this speech, you strongly denounced Russia's um, war on Ukraine and you emphasized um, the importance of international solidarity among fellow democracies. So what is South Korea's future policy toward Ukraine apart from economic support and humanitarian aid? Do you consider the option of sending lethal aid to Ukraine and what would that mean for Korea's own security, considering um, your uh, relations um, with Russia and also, of course, nuclear threat from North Korea. Yeah, 안녕하십니까. 대표님, 저는 원래 기자 출신이고 지금 여기서 fellow로 활동을 하고 있습니다. 먼저 이렇게 찾아주셔서 감사드리고 어, 저는 한국의 우크라이나에 대한 정책에 대해서 질문드리겠습니다. 어제 미국 의회에서 연설하신 거 정말 인상 깊게 봤습니다. 어, 연설에서 대통령께서는 우크라이나에 대한 불법적인 침공을 강력하게 비난하셨, 비판하셨고 어, 또 구, 이에 대응한 어, 국제 민주주의들의 연대를 강조하셨습니다. 어, 그렇다면 한국의 미래에 어, 우크라이나에 대한 정책은 어떤지 여쭙겠습니다. 어, 제가 여쭙고 싶은 것은 경제적 지원이나 어, 그런 인도적 지원이 아닙니다. 어, 혹시 한국 정부는 공격 무기 제공을 고려하고 계십니까? 그렇다면 그 의미는 무엇인지 또 이러한 결정이 한국 안보, 한러 관계뿐만 아니라 북핵 문제와 관련해서도 어떠한 함의가 있는지 여쭙겠습니다. 제 2차 세계 대전 전에도 국제법은 존재했습니다. 그런데 그 시절의 그 국제법이라고 하는 것은 외교관의 지위라든가 특권 또 전쟁을 어떻게 시작할 거며 또 끝났을 때 어떻게 정리를 하고 또 포로를 어떻게 대우해야 되느냐 뭐 이런 것에 대한 또 양국이 조약을 맺을 때 어떤 절차를 밟아야 되느냐 라고 하는 그런 국제법이었고요 제 2차 세계대전 이후의 국제법은 그야말로 전쟁의 참상을 겪고 세계 평화를 지키기 위해서 힘에 의한 현상 변경 자체를 금지하는 그러한 평화의 국제법으로 바뀌었습니다 저는 세계 평화 또 세계 시민의 자유라고 하는 것은 그렇기 때문에 법에 의해서 국제법과 국제 규범을 지키는 것에 의해서 이루어져야 된다는 생각을 가지고 있습니다. 그렇기 때문에 이 우크라이나에 대한 침공은 명백한 국제법 위반이라는 점입니다. 그리고 이 국제법을 집행을 하고 국제법이라는 것은 어떤 국내법과 같이 집행기관은 없지만 국제사회가 연대해서 그 국제법에 합당한 조치들을 취하는 것입니다. 우크라이나에 대해서 대한민국의 독자적인 정책이라는 것은 없습니다. 그래서도 안 된다고 생각합니다. 우리의 우크라이나에 대한 지원 정책은 미국을 비롯한 국제사회와 함께 논의하고 조정해 가면서 해야 되는 것입니다. 저희는 지금 우크라이나의 전황을 예의주시하고 있습니다. 그리고 그 전황에 따라서 저희가 국제사회와 함께 필요한 또 국제규범과 국제법이 지켜지도록 노력할 것입니다. 거기에는 다양한 옵션이 있을 수 있습니다. 그렇게 일단 말씀을 드리겠습니다. Uh, thank you for your question, and I would like to talk about international law. The international law existed even before World War II, but 
back then it was mostly about um, things that uh, regulate the status of a diplomat or the rules about war, how to treat um, prisoners of war, and about um, uh, concluding treaties between countries. However, after World War II, after the humanity experienced the atrocities of war, it became an international law for peace. This means that we prohibit any attempts to alter the uh, status quo by force. Uh, in this regard, it has been my strong belief that the peace and the freedom of world citizens uh, can be upheld by abiding by international law and norms. Uh, in this regard, um, I, I once again reaffirm that uh, the invasion against Ukraine is a flagrant a violation of relevant international law. Of course, uh, there's no authority that enforces international law. However, uh, the, the countries uh, that abide by those norms can stand in solidarity. And in this sense, I believe that there's no such kind of Korea's independent uh, policy toward Ukraine. Our policies toward Ukraine is somewhat a result of our discussions and coordination with the international community, including our ally, the United States. So um, we are closely monitoring the situation that's um, going on on the battlefield in Ukraine, and we will take uh, proper measures in order to uphold the international norms and international law. So right now, uh, we are closely monitoring the situation and we are considering various options. The next question on the left balcony. Thank you, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, President Yoon. My name is Tara Noor, and I am an NTA fellow at the Belfort Center, Harvard Kennedy School. I'm from Pakistan, and my question to you is, uh, to what an extent uh, this visit culminating in Washington Declaration uh, in your view, has allied the voices or concerns within South Korea to acquire nuclear weapons of its own? Uh, and do you think that this acquired confidence will sustain through uh, the next year's presidential election in the U.S. and a potential change uh, in the leadership? Thank you. 대통령님, 어, 저는 파키스탄에서 왔고 어, 또 지금 현재 캐나디 스쿨 벨포 센터에서 펠로우로 있습니다. 어, 이번에 어, 확장 억제와 관련해서 워싱턴 선언을 어, 발표하셨는데 이와 관련해서 어, 질문 드리겠습니다. 어, 지금 한국 국내에 어, 독자적인 핵무작에 대한 의견이 있을 것이라고 생각하고 또 이런 것들이 이번에 또 확장 억제에 대한 신뢰도가 올라간 것에 대해서 어, 영향을 받고 있다고 생각하시는지 그리고 또 미국에도 대선이 있고 정부가 바뀔 수 있는데 그에 따라서 또 상황의 변화가 있을 것이라고 생각하시는지 질문 드리겠습니다. 아, 우리나라에도 <웃음> 독자적인 핵무장을 해야 된다는 여론이 있습니다. 아, 또 북한이 미사일 위협을 고도화할 때마다 그러한 주장이 힘을 얻기도 합니다. 또 대한민국은 핵 무장을 하겠다고 마음을 먹으면 빠른 시일 내에 심지어는 1년 이내에도 핵 무장을 할수 있는 그런 기술 기반을 가지고 있습니다. 그러나 핵이라고 하는 것은 단순한 그 기술의 문제만이 아니고 핵 핵무기와 관련된 복잡한 정치 경제 학과 정치 경제 방정식이라는 것이 있는 것입니다. 우리가 핵을 보유할 때또 포기해야 하는 다양한 또 가치들과 이해관계들이 있습니다. 그런데 국내 여론은 그런 것을 고려하지 않고 단순히 기술적으로 가능하고 북한이 저렇게 위협을 고도화하고 있으니까 우리도 하자고 하는 핵 개발을 하자고 하는 이제 그런 여론으로 보여집니다. 그리고 지금 워싱턴 이 선언은 아까도 제가 말씀드렸습니다만은 북한의 핵이 멀리 떨어져 있는 것이 아니라 그 위험이 지금 눈앞에 와 있고 그리고 아주 구체적이고 마치 그 전쟁 상황이라고 한다면 라운드 하우스처럼 저기 바로 앞에 와 있는 상황입니다. 그래서 이런 실효적인 이 과거에 1953년에 재래식 무기를 기반으로 한 상호 방위 조약에서 이제 핵이 포함된 그런 한미 
그 상호 방위 개념으로 아, 업그레이드 될 수밖에 없는 그런 상황이라고 이해를 하시면 될것 같습니다. 그리고 제가 질문을 제대로 이해를 다 했는지 모르겠는데 좀 추가로 저 설명을 해드리고. Thank you, thank you for your question. And um, yes, uh, there is uh, some opinion in uh, our Korean society that. Due to increasing nuclear missile threats posed by North Korea, that we need to acquire our own nuclear weapons, and they say that we have, uh, we are capable of our science and technology to develop our own nuclear arsenal. However, um, nuclear weapon is not about just technology; uh, it is a very complex politi politics and economics. We have to solve uh, complex equations. We need to give up as many of the values that we've been upholding if we decide to develop our weapons. So I believe that those opinions saying that we need to have our own nuclear arsenal are not considering uh, all these things, all these factors. And about the Washington Declaration, um, uh, I want to note that the North Korean nuclear threat is not a faraway threat. It is imminent. It is at, it is at our front door. Therefore, we need a very practical solution. Um, if it is a war, we are under a, some kind of roundhouse situation. Therefore, um, as we uh, have uh, promised for mutual uh, security in 1953, largely using conventional forces, it is time to raise the effectiveness of the extended deterrence uh, through upgrading our, um, our deterrence posture Uh, by uh, by uh, taking measures, including including also uh, U.S. nuclear capability. So, um, if you'd like to ask something, um, I'd be happy to have one more question from you. 담당자가 바뀌어도 그 워싱턴 선언의 그 어떤 주범적 효력이 지속될 수 있는지에 대한 질문을 아까 주신 것 같은데 저는 당연히 그럴 거라고 생각합니다. 왜냐하면 이거는 불가피한 선택이고 어떤 상황을 저희가 창조한 것이 아니라 우리가 맞닥뜨려서 반드시 극복해야 되는 상황에 대한 불가피한 선택 방안을 담고 있는 것이기 때문에 정부 담당자가 바뀐다고 해서 바뀔 수 없는 것이라고 저는 보고 있고 그 워싱턴 선언에는 미 행정부의 의무만 들어가 있는 것이 아니라 아, 대한민국도 마찬가지의 에, 의무가 있습니다. 아, 우리는 독자 핵 개발을 안 하고 NPT를 존중하고 아, 이런 것이고요. 또 미국은 에, 이, 미국의 핵 자산을 에, 어떻게 사용할 건지 북한의 부채적인 핵 위협에 대해서 어떻게 실효적으로 사용할 건지에 대해서 대한민국과 아, 대한민국의 참여하에 아, 서로 협의를 해서 방안을 마련하고 또 거기에 입각한 그 훈련과 또 연습을 한다는 것들을 담고 있기 때문에 이것은 뭐 정부 담당자가 바뀐다고 해서 그 효력이 바뀔 문제는 아니라고 생각하고요. 그리고 이 확장 억제라고 하는 개념은 나토의 핵 공유 이후에 나온 개념입니다. 그런데 에, 그래서 나토의 핵 공유하고 에, 조금 다르기는 합니다만은 그 실효성이라든가 이런 면에서는 에, 일대일로 맺은 것이기 때문에 에, 나토의 이런 그 다자와의 이런 그 약정보다는 더 저는 실효성이 있다고 에, 판단하고 있고요. 에, 그리고 이런 확장 억제라는 개념이 하나의 선언에서 어, 그치질 않고 어느 특정 국가와 아, 문서로서 어, 정리된 아마 가장 첫 번째의 사례라고 할수 있습니다. 그래서 에, 저는 에, 이 워싱턴 선언의 에, 이런 지속 가능성에 대해서 에, 확고한 믿음을 가지고 있습니다. 네. Uh, so your your question about uh, the possible changes when uh, after the election or if the administration changes, um, I believe that uh, what we have agreed through our Washington Declaration is not an option for us, but it is an inevitable decision facing uh, the nuclear, North Korean nuclear threat. 
So um, I, I believe that also uh, the Washington Declaration does not only contain the responsibilities of the United States. It also includes some duties for the Republic of Korea that we will keep respecting the MPT regime. We will not, uh, try, we will not um, uh, acquire our own nuclear weapons, uh, etc. And it's, it's really about um, how we are going to consult with each other in actually deploying uh, the U.S. nuclear asset in face of um, North Korea's nuclear threat. It is about joint planning and how we're going to consult and select right options uh, through exercises, including on TTX and simulation. So I believe that our position won't change regardless of the change of administration. And to compare uh, our, the U.S. extended deterrence with NATO's nuclear sharing, the concept of nuclear deterrence was really emerged after NATO's nuclear sharing agreement. Uh, however, uh, in some aspect, since um, the U.S. extended deterrence is a one-on-one -on -one agreement, uh, we, we have better effectiveness than a multilateral um, format, which is NATO's um, nuclear sharing. And also, I believe that the Washington Declaration is one of the first documents at, at the leader's level that does not only make extended deterrence as a mere declaration, but a strong commitment written down in um, documents. So I have a firm belief in, it, belief in its sustainability. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, you can see from this enthusiastic audience that we would like to keep you here answering our questions all night. But I'm told that you have a hard stop at five o'clock, and that screen up there tells me it is five o'clock. So I want to thank you for joining us and giving us your wisdom and ask the audience to thank you for being here. That wraps up President Yoon Suk-yeol's speech at Harvard Kennedy School under the theme of a new journey toward freedom. Thanks for staying with us.